Red light on? Yeah. Yeah, red light's on. So somebody can just. Which is all right. Um, <laughs> kidding. Um, okay, so I apologize to the camera because it's hot in here today, so everybody's sweating and fidgety. It's about, what, 34, 35 degrees out today, and we've got the doors open, and yeah, it's crazy hot in here. So uh, I'm going to start every lesson with the same diagram because there is, well, there's one new person tonight, and everybody else that's here has only either seen it once or twice, and whether or not they really understand what's going on yet is still debatable. So we'll start off with the standard. We all know that we were born. We all know that that, uh, that, we're, that we're a man, lowercase m-a-n. <clears throat> and the big problem starts uh, as soon as we get in, uh, out, out of man and human rights and we get into the legal person or man-made law, contract law, whatever you want to call it. So man created government and for government to be able to interact with us in commerce, we had the creation of the legal person. Again, I don't mind using my name. I'm not afraid of the government. I don't think there's something that we should be fighting or thinking that, you know, oh man, if they find out I'm out there teaching people their rights, you know, they're going to kick in my door and shoot me, like that kind of stuff. I really just don't believe any of that. If I wind up dead, you'll know I was wrong. <laughs> right? Even that, I don't care because I'm going to die one day anyways. So if they kill me over it, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cheers to that. It's not like you're working for Rupert. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And someday the, 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 the big executor is going to come for me, and that's the end of my life anyway. So I'd rather do, do something valuable, like teach people their rights before I go. Um, and that way you'll know I was right. Amen. I was wrong about the government killing people, but I was right about everything I'm teaching, because I'm dead. Well, so. <laughs> so, the legal person, not something to be afraid of. It's a tool. Same way government's a tool. Right? And I've explained that to people before. I've got some really nice uh, power tools over here for my job site. Uh, I shouldn't be afraid of them just because if I was stupid enough to actually nail myself with my hammer, you know, ah, you know I'll throw my air hammer away, you know, because, oh, look at that garlic, look what it did to me, you know, I just shot myself. Well, yeah, because I, I shot myself with it, you know, learn to use tools properly and they become very advantageous. They're not, nothing to be feared or scared of or walking into court and I'm, I'm not a person, I'm a man. Okay, well, that's... Again, what we've learned in the other two episodes, that's not what's going on in court at all. So it's not like anybody's there to be like, oh, oh, you're, oh, sorry, we didn't know you were a man. Well, I guess we're going to drop all charges against you. Like, that's not going to happen. That's why it's not really a valid argument. So, legal person, where did it come from? Okay. Well, I actually brought my first visual aid, my third appearance in now. So you were born. You're uh, whatever hospital, and the doctor filled out a uh, whatever something of live birth. I can't remember what they're called, right? With a doctor's signature on it, and your parents then filled out an application for a birth certificate called the Particulars of Live Birth. Which, if you go down, you get a copy of it. And this is mine. I think it's my original, actually. Um, no, I do have the original. This is a secondary one. Either way, first thing, it's on legal paper, right? So we know it's an actual legal document. This is a legal sized document. It's from vital stats, particulars of live birth, yada, 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 the whole nine yards, right? So you get one of these. Actually, you don't get one of these. You send one of these into the government. And what you get back out is the birth certificate. And the birth certificate has the name of the legal person on it. So the only thing we're going to be addressing then in all of our lectures is we don't get into human rights and all that kind of stuff because we know what human rights are. We all know what we have the right to do. We have the right to do anything we want anything as long as we don't and what's the three word sentence on that do no harm do no harm it's three letters sorry it's three words it's like seven letters it's the most simple law on the planet and that's your human right do anything you want just do no harm until you do harm you're free to do whatever you want so there's your human rights course right there it's done everyone graduated very simple so legal person what is it well obviously something happened because your parents filled out a form and sent it to the government so that means we have a two-party contract now that created something. And you get this document back from the government that has a name on it, which is a legal person, and it's signed by the Director of Vital Statistics. And that's a big key right there as well, because it's the only document you're ever going to get, usually, from the government, that the government's signature is on it. 
because it's an obligation on their part. They owe you something. Why do they owe you something? Well, now we have to figure out what the legal person is and why does the government owe you something. So where does this guy come from? Well, I explained it, uh, I explained it once in trust law and I can, we'll go through it once in trust law and then convert everything again to corporate law so the terms are easier to, easier to understand. So if your parents, and we'll, we'll switch the triangle around this time now, so it's a little easier so we can start concentrating on public and private. So I'm going to invert the triangle from where it was last time. Right? And we're going to start up here with your parents came and basically were the grantor of an estate. You know what? I'm going to write that bigger just because I noticed in the last two films it's hard to read my writing at times. So grantor, which means that your birthright is your share of the commonwealth of this nation. It has value. You can't get a check and just be bought out. It has value, but only when it's part of the collective, right? And the government is what represents the collective whole of all the trusts when they're put together, and all the value of the commonwealth. And they're there really to kind of protect your, 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 your estate. Otherwise, somebody with uh, more guns than you would come along with six of his buddies and just rob you for everything you're worth. So it's actually a good thing. We just have to learn how to use it because it's kind of, we've been directly misled and not educated as to who we are and what our rights are in the public schools, subsequently paid for by them, which is our money. So uh, we've been fooled by our own money. So anyways, your parents are the grantors and they took all the value that is your estate, that is your commonwealth birthright, and they granted it to the government on your behalf because you're a minor. And the grantor and the beneficiary, and beneficiary are the same thing, despite repeated objections I've had with people I know. So I call this the grantor slash beneficiary. Okay, it's a little messy. So they're the grantor and the beneficiary of something. And then, <clears throat> what do we know from the other, the other rules of trust law? There's three rules in trust law. We've got the grantor beneficiary, we've got the trustees, and we've got who else? Executors. Executor of a, of a, of a trust. Trustees are the employees. Well, yeah, we'll get into that. So we've got the executor, yeah. So we've got the executor, and we've got trustees. So we know who we are already because we know we're the grantor and beneficiary of the legal person because we've got the birth certificate. That's a warehouse receipt. That's the starting, the starting point of how we can start to decipher everything that's going on here and who we are. So you got your warehouse receipt from the government that says, thank you for depositing something into our corporation. Uh, here's your receipt. It's a very valuable document. Keep it. I think it even says that on some of the papers you get. Very valuable. Keep it safe, the whole nine yards, yada, yada, right? They never said that was you. You can't be the legal person, but you're a very important component of the legal person. When you become the age of majority, you become the grantor and beneficiary of the legal person. It's all your equity that is in that legal person. And equity is king in commerce. He who owns is in complete control, period. So, we've got the grantor beneficiary, the executor, and then we've got the trustees over here. So we know who we are. We know we're the grantor beneficiary because we've got the receipt at home. So let's just erase that. Let's figure out who we are here. So I already know the dean, the man, is the grantor and the beneficiary of a legal person because I've got the birth certificate. So we'll even write that in here. Birth certificate. Uh, and we can get into all this, but I like to switch it up to uh, I like to switch it to corporate law to help everybody understand, even right at this point already. Um, because once you understand the roles that are being played here, and everyone knows this from last time, if if Dean, the guy with the birth certificate, who is also the grantor and beneficiary, that's the key role beneficiary. That's the key role in everything that's going on here. Because now we're going to switch everything to corporate law right away. Because that's essentially what this is, even though you, it's an express trust, for lack of a better word. It really is, but it's all based on corporate law. Which is, corporate law is just trust law. It's a branch of trust law. 
and I spoke about that last time, even if you've read Weiss's Trust Handbook, which is only, what, 80-something pages? It's really confusing to people the first 10 times they read it, unless they know something about law or they're good at reading, right? It's just very confusing, so there's no point in trying to explain that. But everybody understands corporations. So let's just pretend he's a corporation, which he is. He's a form of a corporation. Now, in corporate law, we've got almost the same, it's, it's the same matrix, because we'll talk about that, but why everything follows the, the, the same, the same three-party matrix here. And if we were to switch to corporate law, the guy with the birth certificate, the guy who is the grantor, the beneficiary, the guy who invested everything into a company, who is he? Shareholders. Shareholders. Now, in bigger companies, obviously, they have all sorts of different shares you buy, and they've got multiple types of share, you know, shareholders and different shareholders and different kinds of voting shares and everything else. But for our purposes, we now are actually the sole shareholder of all the equity in the birth certificate. Owner. Um, owner. I wouldn't even call it owner, right? Owner. No, one really, no one really owns the name. That's when, when, when you look at shares, it's that you own a share of the company. You own a share. You know, that, but that's so the, share the share of the company is the equity, though. No one really owns the company. So that's another point here, too, is people have asked me, and I've heard the question come up many, many times, well, who owns title to the name, and who owns the name, and this and that, and the simple answer is nobody. The legal person is its own entity, right? It can buy property, it can sell property, it has rights, it can sue, it can be sued, it can do all sorts of stuff, but it needs people to act for it to do that. And that's where us acting in different roles and capacities comes in. And we have to learn those roles, but we've never been taught them, ever. So it's almost like foreign concepts to us once we finally do understand it. That's why I sometimes like to ask people, you know, like, do I want to go back over something? Because I do understand it, and I realize a lot of people don't at first. So it's, and I, I don't, it's hard to really understand what level people are at sometimes. So we're just going to keep going over this model every time we teach one, we teach one of these lessons, lessons first. So now we know Dean, the man, Again, I'm going to write that bigger because I promised I would. Dean. Dean is the sole shareholder of the legal person or the corporation. He's the sole shareholder. He's the only one that owns equity in the legal person. But no one else does. It was my share of the Commonwealth that went into the creation of this as a contract with the government. Well, yeah. Good point. I like that. Um, so, who are the other roles here? Well, if this was corporate law, in trust law, the executors are the ones who basically uh, di direct the way the, the estate's going to be uh, going to be dealt with after the death of uh, of, the, of the grantor kind of thing, right? So, an executor in corporate law would be the same thing as a director. Somebody on the board of directors, somebody who's in control of the corporation. Executive authority, exactly, because that's all an executor is in trust law. So exec, um, executor and uh, administrator, I like to call it too, executive decisions. Trustees. Well, we've only got one part left in a corporation here. We've got, the, we've got the investors and shareholders, we've got the directors, and then we've got the employees of a corporation. So we can even leave trustee there and just write employees below it. Trustees or, a little or in here, employees. So, we've identified ourselves as the sole shareholder of the corporation or the legal person. It's ours. We own all the equity. No one else has claim to our share of the Commonwealth, whatever that might be. It's ours, even though it's part of the collective, the greater good of Canada. So, how do we know who a director is then? Shareholder appoints directors. Shareholders owns everything. They want to appoint somebody to make sure that corporations being run properly in corporate law. So the shareholders get together. They have little shareholders meetings. Uh, usually most corporations, all the shares are owned by the director of a corporation, right? I don't know. At least most of them. At least most of them, whichever, yeah. So either way, they get together. They have shareholder meetings. And uh, shareholders are the only ones that can get together and appoint or remove directors based on performance. Like, we don't like the way that... What this guy's doing. We don't like the policies he's setting. So we're going to have a little shareholders meeting. 
and we're going to remove that guy. We don't like him. We don't think he's operating everything that's in our best interests. So the shareholders, they're obligated to do it, yes. The directors are obligated to do what would be in the best interest of the shareholders. That's just a maxim of corporate law, period. Right? So the directors are appointed over here. Directors set policy. Every corporation has policy that it has to follow. And they do that to tell the employees what to do. The employees then in turn run the corporation by the policy set for them for the benefit of <coughs> the shareholders. And that's it. It doesn't get any more simple than that. So basically the government trust the director would be the queen and everyone in government would be the trustees. For government. Well, um, that government. well that, that's something else we'll touch on later today for the first time. We'll get into what the government trust is because this is only one part. You've got to remember the government is another trust of its own that we interact with. So that's... In terms of the monetary system, now they borrow, they create bonds to create the money for the Bank of Canada. We can get into all that. So let's, set, let's stick with this for now though. So we know that the directors who set policy, the employees who listen to them for the purpose of the benefit of the sole shareholder. Now we know that we, well, no, correct, we don't know that yet. So sole shareholders appoint directors. So if I'm, or sorry, shareholders period appoint directors. So if I'm the shareholder, who am I going to appoint as a director? I usually would appoint myself. I can appoint anybody I want. Who else could I trust? Exactly. Like I like to say, my grandfather always told me, if you want to do something, have something done right, you do it yourself. So I'm the director. Director Dean. And in trust law, you can be the director, you can be the executor, and the beneficiary of an estate in the same capacity. The only one you can't be is a trustee in the same capacity. And that's where capacity comes in. You can be in a different capacity. And that's other stuff we have to touch on. But now we've got Director Dean. Now what's the only role left if government's a part of this equation? Government. government. Trustees or employees would be government. So we'll just write, uh, we'll replace trustees with government. And they're all employees and they're limited liability, they're licensed and bonded in the whole nine yards and they're basically the trustees of the employee, the public employees of this corporation. Okay, so we know how this works now. That's the relationship. The director gives orders, the employees listen, it's done for the benefit of the shareholder who appoints the directors. It just keeps going around. That's the Holy Trinity. That's where corporate law comes from. That's the original trust law that, uh, that they get into in the Bible with, uh, with God and the creation of the earth. Everything is all based on this model. It just depends on filling the roles with the appropriate individual for the purpose that, you're, that you've, uh, if you've entered into a contract with somebody uh, for any reason, it all comes down to who what roles everybody's playing, right? And that's what's going on in court, and that's what I like to, we get into that later, is everybody doesn't understand the role and what's going on here. The same way in a chess board, you know, you can't play chess unless you know the role of the pieces that are on the board. It doesn't matter what the piece is called. If you don't understand its role, what moves it's supposed to make, chess is going to be a very hard thing. So there's got to be order to all this, right? Um, I've talked before about the fact that because you're an investor in the, co in the government, and the, you know, the government's got an obligation to you, and you've got an obligation to it, I covered on that before about, uh, you know, people presume all sorts of things about, well, yeah, we're obligated to obey statutes because of that and the whole nine yards. No, absolutely we are not. Because if you want to use the word express trust for the legal person, that's what it really is. You're not liable to, to obey government statutes of any kind. And we talk about that. Um, and the biggest reason being is that your, your part of this equation ends with your investment. That's your only obligation to the government was your investment. That's it. Unless anybody has ever seen an investor in Microsoft working on the assembly lines in Japan or China putting computer parts together. But uh, being, uh, you have two places up there. Yep. Your shareholder yep. and the director. You've appointed yourself director. Oh, okay. So that's going to have, so that's going to have its own kind of liabilities attached to it, right? When you apply for a social insurance number, you yep. can take up two of those positions 
making a food director then? Ah, no. When you apply for a social insurance number, what's happening is uh, the man is the sole shareholder, and that never changes. You could maybe even appoint somebody else a beneficiary. I really don't know. It's probably possible. But either way, you're the grantor or shareholder. You're the director. You're the one that gives direction to a legal person, right? To, to, to navigate it, to be the captain of the ship. Now, sometimes though, like, you have uh, like Red Lobster or West Jet where you have the employees and they're now that are shareholders. And that's the same also if you look on a fishing ship, the employees of the crew have a little part. They've got a share in what's going on. Yeah. That's true. Okay. So what government has done is, and we all know from, from reading statutes, if we don't all know, and I could probably find it real quick in the, uh, was it the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and I think it's specifically 32 and 52 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, if you go through it, we know that government statutes only apply to agents of the government. That's all it applies to, agents of the government. It doesn't apply to you. That's why they never violate your human rights. They're always very specific about what they do. So what government does, like summary convictions court, for instance, if they're trying to enforce a statute against you, what they've done is they've gone out and they've, uh, well, let's backtrack a little bit. Government has devised a way to get you to unknowingly contract with them that turns you into one of these employees down here. So you can be a trustee or an employee of your own legal person in a different capacity. So government has gone out and they've got you to come in and to apply for some kind of ID of some kind that's government issue like a driver's license, a social insurance number, some other benefit that gives you a nice little card, mantle, a liquor card, something. And what that ID does is identifies you as an agent of the government. So now you're operating in a different capacity, but you're liable for the capacity you're operating in as the man. You're always liable. It doesn't matter what capacity you're operating in, you're liable for it. Is that... Any one person or individual or anything? Yeah, it's a definition within the criminal code, um, so it's their definition. Yeah, right? exactly. But even their definition works in your favor, and it means includes her majesty, majesty and an organization. Yeah, you're, you're not going to get anywhere with that, that argument in court, though. That's the problem. I've, I've seen everybody make these arguments in court. Okay, second, uh, when you go into court, you're operating, or they are operating under the presumption that you've already appointed them as director or administrator. Nope. Mm -hmm. So what is going on in court? Now, okay, well, we'll get into that. So let's just understand that this is actually, this is the power structure. This is the important part. So once you understand the power structure, what we're going to get into later explains how to handle yourself in court and what's exa what exactly is going on in court. So the power structure is you're the investor. You're the shareholder. You are the uh, grantor and beneficiary of everything that is in the legal person. And that puts you in, in the seat of power because it's all yours. Right? Uh, question. Uh, only man can create value. Does that fit in there? Because Absolutely. Absolutely only man can create value. Everything that government has, they got from us. And that's another thing we can talk about sometime, and I usually do, is the fact that actually government cannot have a binding contract with you based on even one of the rules of, of contracting, which is uh, valuable consideration. What could government possibly give you that you don't already have? Because everything government has came from you in the first place. You've already got everything you need. You don't need anything from them. So no contract to identify you as a public servant could be binding in the first place. Right? I don't believe it could be. But I wouldn't even attack it from that angle. It gets a lot more simple than that. So the shareholder, you own everything. You've appointed a director. The director gives the marching orders to these guys down here, uh, the trustees, the government employees, and they perform. That doesn't mean you walk up to a cop on the street and you say, hey, you, I'm the director, you know, drop and give me 20 kind of thing. Like, no. Like, the, what they do is, um, and we'll get, into, we'll get into the other triangle that's going on here, too. We'll get into that later, because I think more, more people have court problems than anything, right? So what's going on in court? We know now that court, especially with summary convictions, is an internal tribunal for government employees, public servants. It's not binding on you at all. So the presumption when you walk into court is that you, that's why police, when they pull you over, what do they want to see? ID. ID. If you give them government issue ID, then it's identified you as an agent of the government. 
So the presumption now is you're performing some function of government. And if you're performing a function of government, you have to do it, you have to do what the government says because you're under the liability of the government now for being one of these guys. Because government's assumed all liability for their employees. Government can be sued if you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing when you're performing a function of government. So that's all the Criminal Code of Canada is, is a rule book for employees. And if you don't do what you're supposed to be doing, you're going to be penalized because the government's assumed liability for your actions. You're part of the person. That's, that's why exactly. you're included. And this is the reason why. Okay. When you walk into court, summary convictions, and they call the name of the legal person, they're not calling you. They're calling a hearing for the legal person, which is a corporation. No different than what a boardroom meeting would be or any kind of a, a formal hearing, a formal setting where records are being kept for the legal person. Right? And they really need you there because they're the one they, that they want to get to assume liability for everything that's going on because they just drafted a bunch of securities and stuff like that and they really need you to, you know, to, to, to take the li yeah, yeah, to sign them and authorize them. And, right? So now the, the fact that we're the, uh, the, the, the grantor, the beneficiary, the sole shareholder, and the director is irrelevant now because now we want to start dealing with what ha what's happening when you're in court. Um, so we got summary convictions. Um, so they call they call the legal person, and most people stand up and they start their arguments about I'm a man and this and that and everything else, and uh, or I'm an agent for the legal person, uh, whatever their argument's going to be. Okay, well, no one's disputing you're you're not a man. First of all, they know you have human rights. The problem is if you are performing a function of government, which means you're licensed and bonded by the government, and they're assuming liability for you, you have to do what they say. That's a liability issue. If you're not licensed and you're not bonded, you're not performing a function of government, then why would you have to answer to them? Right? So they have to trick you into thinking that you're a public servant, which is one of the three roles of your legal person. So you walk in there and you're saying, well, you know, I'm here regarding that matter. I'm, I'm, I'm here for that person, people have said, or I'm, I'm an agent for that person. Okay? You have to be an agent of that person to be in that courtroom to have standing. Everyone in that courtroom is an agent for the legal person for that particular instance. When, as soon as it's called, that's now a formal hearing for the legal person as of the minute they call that court case. Are you going to say something? Uh, I don't want to get into the, the real the derail of it, but you can introduce another party into uh, the matter. Yeah. Would there be a, a, re a, a reason to, though? Uh, I like going in as a third party intervener or a parent. Friend of the court, all that kind of stuff, yeah, but you're not going to be able to do any, you're, you're not going to. Um, I think your standing is vastly limited by that. And people should stop being scared of the name and start com controlling it, which is who they are, right? Assuming the, you know, you're the captain of the ship. You're the guy that owns all the cargo. That puts you in two fundamental positions of power regarding the legal person. So why, why would you want to walk away from that and say, well, I'm just a third, you know, I'm, I'm a friend of the court kind of thing, right? Well, because if you're not, well, not to, to go further, but if, if you introduce yourself as... I came in as the, as the, uh, the representative of the paramount security interest holder in the property of the, the person. Yeah. So at that point, I, it's no longer a sole shareholder. I'm coming in as beneficiary. Yeah, and, and again, yeah, and I've, I've, I've said that before, that when, when people go in and they become, they're uh, there as the beneficiary, <coughs> judges have no problem with that, right? Yeah, they're like, okay, well, you know, just sit back there and shut your mouth then because you're just the beneficiary. You have no say in anything that goes on here kind of thing, right? If you had a problem, you can always bring it up at a boardroom meeting later when you guys have a shareholders meeting and vote in a new director and do I like you're just you're just here to accept benefits or refuse them or do whatever, right? It's not a position of authority of any real kind that they recognize. Yes. So the judge is not assuming that position of authority. No. What the judge wants is the judge wants somebody who is a liable public servant. Liable. You're li so they need somebody to assume liability for the charges before the court. And they need, it has to be a public servant because that's all they can charge in the first place. That's why they need a driver's license, a social insurance number, any other form of ID when you get pulled over. And that's when the law, that's when the realm of presumption starts to take over, right? And we've talked about presumptions before, where it's just presumed you were acting as a public servant. Jurisdiction is presumed. They, have, they operate on all these presumptions. Now, we don't know what presumptions they are. 
because I don't know what anybody's presuming about anything right now, right? You can make guesses about what somebody's presuming based on their actions, but for the most part, we have no idea what people are presuming about uh, life in general or what people are thinking. All we can do is make statements of facts about ourselves. So that's where we start to dismantle their presumptions. And some real easy questions are, you know, well, number one, if you show up and you're just an agent of that, of that legal person, they're presuming you're an agent in the capacity of a public servant because that's all that hearing is for. The court, the summary convictions court is a internal tribunal for public servants, period. It's for agents of the government, right? Because if you were charged under a statutory offense, only public servants can be charged with a statutory offense. So you're kind of proving the presumption just by even being there. So you're helping them with that. Um, so when you show up for court, if you don't deal with it administratively, which I much prefer now and I went to that last time, is when you walk in, you can do nice, simple little things, um, like saying, oh, I'm here regarding that matter. When they say, well, who are you? Say, well, uh, I'm a man. You can say, I'm the, I'm the, the sole shareholder and I'm the, the director of the legal person. Can you say that I'm here to affirm my understanding? No, I would just say, don't get into any, anything fancy with them, right? That's a kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple. That's why, I mean, there's, there's three words in this matrix when you look at it, right? You, you can't screw it up if you keep to the least amount of words possible. Unlike the guys in the States that are trying to argue UCC law with, with, with judges in court, where they go on five-minute tirades of, of, of stuff that most human beings couldn't even comprehend, right? Keep it simple. Hey, I'm here. Take your birth certificate. Say, I've got this. Say, I've got this birth certificate right here. Uh, I was sent this when I was born. Um, Say, so it's my understanding this makes me the sole shareholder of the legal person. Say, and as such, I would assume that I can appoint directors or executors of my legal person, so, I, I, so I'm the director of it as well. Is anybody disputing that? I guess a nice way of saying that, isn't it? Right? If they freak out at that point, well, you know what, that's kind of their problem. So, but I will say they don't like that stuff happening when they're surprised by it, especially because that's a good way of embarrassing them all, right? Because again, and I touched on this last time, the judges are only operating on... The information given to them by the Crown. The Crown has claimed that you're a public servant. You have to be for the Crown to be bringing you there because that's all they have jurisdiction over. So that's all the judge is operating on. So you can clean up that little presumption before you even get to court by sending stuff down to the court file, contacting the Crown in advance and saying, hey, I think your, your cops may, made a mistake. There appears to be a misunderstanding because uh, when they pulled me over, uh, they, they must have assumed I was a public servant when they were beating me because I'm, I'm not aware that I, that I am a public servant. And that's, you know, you can use negative averments at that point too, which I like, you know, I haven't, and you haven't produced any facts or evidence that I was acting as a public servant at the time I was arrested, and I believe no such evidence exists. Put the burden on them to prove that you're a, a public servant, and when they don't reply, we got a month to deal with this stuff. And they give us a month. They give us a grace period. You know, they're, they're not dragging us. Well, they have. They have with me, especially because I was being quite belligerent. They normally don't drag you right into court and, you know, try you right there on the spot. And out comes the guillotine and you're done. When you demand maybe a corpus, like that, though. Um, yeah, I mean, habeas corpus, that's what, uh, produce the claim or produce the body kind of stuff. Body, well, it's the they, body of the child. Yeah, that too, the, the body of evidence, that kind of stuff, yeah. The old thing of, like, you're trying to do the murder. Why not make the, the argument more simple, though? Like I say, like all, there's, we, uh, uh, believe me, I could write a book on ways you could probably go into court and make arguments and drag it out as long as possible in the whole nine yards. But it gets. These videos are dying, it, won't be a book. it probably will, yeah, exactly. Eh? So. <laughs> yeah. So we like to keep it simple, and that's uh, very nicely contacting the Crown in advance saying, hey, I believe there's been a misunderstanding. I'm going to give you a chance to, 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 to remedy the situation. Right? And then have him basically ask him for some evidence of some kind. If he doesn't uh, answer to it, then you respond to him or you default him. Well, you default him. Yeah, you just default him. Right? You don't need to wait for anything. Yep. You just write a letter or does it have to be registered? Does it have no, when I, when I default somebody, I write up something called the, uh, I used to do notices of default, where I just send them a notice that I've defaulted them. If you really want to get fancy, write up a certificate of default. And when you go down to the court, have the magistrate stamp your uh, in affidavit form that they never replied to you. So, 
Yeah, so if you've sent your request in the form of a negative averment that says you haven't produced any, uh, any evidence, uh, I haven't seen, or, or if any facts or evidence, and I believe no such evidence exists that I was a public servant at the time I was detained and, and a complaint was made, right? Then you default them on that. You send that into, into the court file with a, with a motion to dismiss the charges. Okay, that has to be an affidavit or a doesn't have to be an affidavit, no. I, I prefer it is because an affidavit is what? Judgment and commerce. An, ever, an unrebutted affidavit is judgment and commerce. That's judgment. You don't even need a Queen's Bench justice for that. That's judgment. You dealt with it outside the court before there was even a hearing, and it's done. No judge can overturn that. Nothing. Right? So that'll probably happen to you once. Especially if you have a fee schedule in place. Because now what happens, as soon as you have the summary convictions uh, charges dealt with, you're going to come right back around and you're now going to enforce your rights, which are in Queen's Bench. And we spoke about that in one of the previous videos. Because Queen's Bench is where you enforce your common law rights, your equity. I was damaged. I'm an injured party. You take it to Queen's Bench, you'll get a hearing, and if you file it properly, and you've got unrebutted affidavits, and you've got your claim settled in advance. Never go to court unless you've won. Never go there until you've won. I believe I learned that six years ago from a Winston Schultz seminar. I never knew what that meant until I understood what Queen's Bench was. And then I realized, well, yeah, when we each have lawyers, and the case has not been settled, it's just a couple of idiots rambling back and forth, which is what lawyers are, the judge has to make a determination based on all the, 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 the crap that's gone on in the courtroom in front of the judge. When you use it properly, and you file with a unrebutted affidavit, and all your paperwork done A to Z in advance, the only reason you're going to be going there is for default judgment. There's going to be no reply from the other party. In fact, they can't reply because you've already got them in default. It's done. You already have judgment in commerce. In fact, that's one of the maxims I quote in the front page of my commercial lien. So I like to do the commercial lien process, and I've simplified it and improved it a whole lot. But then I take the completed... I use that with you Yeah. That's where it all came from. Um, okay, so just we'll cover two more points real quick to kind of go over the same trinity, the triangle that we spoke about before, just as further proofs of what's going on. And that's getting into Admiralty Law and Commerce, which Walter brought up there, where we got the same thing going on here, where we've got the guy who owns the goods that are being shipped on, on a vessel, on a boat. So you've got the, if you want to call that an investor, what would you want to call that? The, uh, well, why don't you label the triangle as either, you can listen, it's like ship, well, let's just call it, yeah. corporation. Well, let's just call it a ship, right? <coughs> so we've got, a mer we've got a merchant vessel. Who owns all the goods in the hold that are being transported, right? We'll call it, just call it an investor, whatever you want to call it. Or, or yeah, well, just, yeah, so investor or uh, owner, property owner. Sure, owner, property owner, the owner of the ship. There you go, property, no, not the owner of the ship. The, prop, the owner of the property in the ship, the goods being, uh, you know, beaver pelts back in the day, back in the, the Voyager days and whatnot, right? So you've got the property owner owns all this materials in the ship that are being shipped. It's owned by another company altogether. That's irrelevant in this equation. Then you've got the captain of the ship. It doesn't, it's different here. Responsibility for the yes. Captain. You got, so you got the property owner of the property being shipped. You've got the captain of the ship. And then you've got the, 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 the ship, the, the people that work on the ship. Let's say the, the crew, the sailors, right? So the crew of the ship. The thing you've got to remember about the ship is that it's its own person. It is its own person, exactly. And, and, and the cargo that's on the ship is basically being put into the care of that person. The yeah. So, 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 so title to the ship is irrelevant. Like ship. Yeah, the title to the ship is irrelevant. It's who owns all the equity in the hold that's important, right? And of course, the legal person is obligated to repay the people that own all the materials in the hold, if it gets lost or stolen, that's where all the insurance came from. But either way, you've got the same relationship going on here. You've got the property owner, you've got the captain, you've got the crew, right? The other, the other triangle is, and we'll get into this another time, I'll just touch on it real quick tonight, so we remember to go into this, um, is the government, right? The government is its own trust. Your legal person that was created is just your agent in dealing with the government. That's your agent in commerce. So the same way that the government makes up one role of your uh, legal person, 
you make up one within the government and that's what kind of what makes the union complete and you are basically a shareholder of the government so instead of sole shareholder you're now one of 33 million something shareholders in the government so you now come your legal person is now the investor in the government and who do we all vote for once every four years or whenever they're <coughs> deemed to be incompetent and somebody calls an election right so the ministers so we vote for them ministers are the people who direct the government right they set government policy and they set government policy for who government employees Right? Not a very good S. So, you're not the investor in the government. Your legal person is. <clears throat> and that's why the name on the voting registry is the all capital letter name. It's the name of the legal person. Your interface with the government. So it's a dual trust relationship, right? So you're not directly connected to the government. You're connected to the government through your legal person. That's why the best term I've heard for it yet is agent and commerce. I love that one. I think it's the most apt term there is for this kind of stuff. So when it comes to the government, that is the relationship between it. So every, every relationship that's out there regarding commerce usually, not usually, revolves entirely around this matrix. And then the only question is, well, who's the equity holder? Who's the directors and who's the employees? And you can usually deduce that from the information that's around you. And that's drawing your own presumptions that you can leave open to other people to rebut if they don't think you're correct in your dealings. That's why it's always best, and I've told people this before, so we'll just get into a little bit of philosophical stuff here real quick. We'll call it short because it's a really hot night and I just want to get home. I was sick for three days, so. Um, always contact the government in advance and set your roles, set your status in advance. So there's no question down the road when it comes to a bad time to be figuring that kind of stuff out. Everybody wants to leave stuff until it's, until it's just the worst possible moment to get everything all sorted out. And that's court. That's a bad time to, to start establishing your roles with the government, right? So contact them now. Send them off a notice. And we talked about this in the last video. It's my understanding that this birth certificate, don't, don't be coy with these people. Just come right out and say what you mean. I mean, that's what substance is, right? There's no form to this. Substance. It's what your understanding of things are. And if you're wrong or they think differently, they can correct you and they can negotiate with you or send you a di oh no 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 I, you know no that's really not it actually it's our opinion that you know blah 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 blah. You, you can't consider politeness when you're seeking understanding. Exactly. I want to understand this, so I'm going to be as blunt and as simple, keep it simple, simple, stupid as possible. It's my understanding that this birth certificate was generated by the filing of that particular of a live birth into the vital statistics. That would make me the investor. That would make that that means that I own all the equity in whatever was created, being this legal person. Do you, de do you deny this? You know, if no timely rebuttal, it is agreed that. When they don't rebut, your, your statement stands. You know, and then go on from there. And then just say, well, and that being the case, I understand that uh, you know, I'm appointing, uh, I can appoint myself as the director. So, so unless you can provide lawful excuses to why I can't, this is your notice that I am the director of the legal person. I've never seen any evidence or been presented with any facts that I'm obligated to perform a function of government for any reason. Do you have any proof that I am? Like phrase it any way you want as long as you can prove that the, 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 the substance of the statement is what you want it to say. And that's why I try to keep people from trying to use all these fancy words to prove how smart they are. Okay? I don't want to do that. I want to use the most simple dumbed down word I can possibly use that leaves absolutely nothing open to interpretation. I want nothing open to interpretation. If you're using a word that you want to make sure they know what you mean, then you can include the Black's Law definition of that word in your, you know, I believe that blah, 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 blah. Like when I contacted, uh, one second, when I contacted the uh, city prosecutor that time and I said, I believe that I own my property in fee simple as um, as defined in Black's Law Dictionary. And then I gave the Black's Law Dictionary term, which meant absolute authority over my property. Their definition of fee simple in the Land Titles Act, or whatever the hell it's called, 
says that they're a joint tenant in common. But we don't rebut that. So I contact him in advance now and I say, it's my belief I own it in fee simple, according to this definition. And then I said, if you've got a different definition, that's your own problem, because that's within your own act, and your act doesn't apply to me. That's your act, not mine. These are my definitions. If you're claiming otherwise, you've got X amount of days to get back to me, otherwise you agree with me. So start contacting government in advance and start setting these rules before you wind up in court on a misunderstanding that you're a public servant. And that's why you asked them that very explicitly and clearly. Uh, are we living in an open air prison or a free society? Like, are you a slave? In yeah. Essence? Well, they're, 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 they're through trickery and, you know, uh, and, and really trying to conceal what's going on and uh, fogging everything that's going up just so you well, don't really understand. Clarity. Yeah, they're, they're, I mean, look, look at their law books. They've got stuff this thick meant to confuse you. That tells me right away that I want to get, I, I want to limit what I'm saying with them to the least confusing statement possible. Because everything they do is about generating paperwork that's confusing. So we want to simplify that, use the most simple words we can, and tell them right at the outset. By the way, before I start even speaking in this letter, I want you to know that the definition of every word in my letter is found in Black's Law Dictionary. Or Webster's. Or Webster's. I like to use Black's. It's a good common law dictionary, right? Right? Yeah, you can get into Bouvier's. is a really excellent one if you want to get into law. But, uh, but if you start speaking people's common English or whatever, yeah. Yeah. Yep. then uh, precedent would be set. Like, yep. But just outline which dictionary you want to use then. If you want to use Webster's, use Webster's. It's your life, it's your rights, it's your rules. Use Sesame Street. <laughs> there you go, yeah, I don't care. In fact, create your new definitions like the government does in the Interpretation Acts. That's what I do, yeah. There you go. By the way, when I say this, it really means this. Yeah. If you really want to confuse well, them, but... the definition is like, well, since I sent them a notice saying the definition of a free man is anyone that does this, that's the definition of it. Yeah, it's whatever definition you want to use, but make sure there's clarity between the parties. Because again, if you go to court, you're going to want facts. And what are facts? Facts are agreement of the parties. This is not a pen unless me and the other parties say it's a pen. Otherwise, we have a dispute. Okay. You said to contact government. Who do you recommend sending these letters? Well, it depends. What purpose are you... Uh, so the question was, when you're contacting them, who do you contact? Okay. So what purpose are you contacting them for? About a driver's license? That's good. They're only claiming that you have to follow the Highway Traffic Act. So right, who's... It's just about the birth certificate, like you were saying. Okay, that, that's, the, that's another matter altogether. I'd contact Vital Statistics. There's a, there's a minister that's in charge for that. Um, <clears throat> and I, I can't remember... Um, for the social insurance number, it's Human Resources Canada, which is Diane Finley right now. For the Receiver General, for other purposes that I was doing, that's uh, Rona Ambrose. Uh, there's a bunch of them, but technically look for the minister that's responsible for whatever act you're looking at addressing. Like if they're claiming you need a driver's license, anything to do with MPIC, the roads, anything, that, that all filters up through the Attorney General's office. So you want to be contacting the, the appropriate officer, exactly. If you just start sending stuff off to the Lieutenant Governor, you know, just in a big tirade, I mean, that's, yeah, you're just going to look like a loose cannon. Yeah. But I will say, when I did have a problem with government, I brought it up with the appropriate minister, and they took no action, and they failed in their duty to do anything about it, then I went next up. I didn't go to the premier, because I don't care about the premier. I went to the guy that appoints the premier. And if you read in their own, uh, their own laws, they'll tell you flat out that the lieutenant governor of Manitoba basically takes the guy who had the, 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 the leader of the party with the most votes and invites him to become the premier. That tells me we're not really picking him. Right. Okay. Right? Um, uh, sorry, just in follow-up to that question, CFS, who would you... Uh, that is Gord McIntosh. We don't contact these guys on a regular basis. I don't know who they all are, eh? <laughs> yeah, Gord McIntosh is in charge of... Uh, he's responsible for the CFS Act, which is actually... They're actually a private corporation called All Nations... Coordinated Child Family Services Network. That's the real name of them. I've got a copy of their act right here. They're a private... Yeah, we had to get a copy from, uh, from the Woodsworth building, right from the corporation's office. 
where actually they're actually like literally a registered corporation right in the Woodsworth building in the company's office where their motto is like facilitating something something between government and the public or whatever and it's like, like they're just so, it, it's just it's there it's like I keep telling people we've been going through this jungle with a machete for, for a year you know for a decade trying to get to, to where we're going we get there and we, and we look right beside us and we've just been cutting bush through a super highway the whole time it's right there and once you get up to the top and you get talking to some of these guys which we have they all know it it's not like it's a secret, right? But they know 95% of the people more are going to go away and not try to enforce their rights just because they just don't want to deal with it. So well, that's their job. Don't they just don't understand. They don't want to deal with it. They just prefer just to have their license and pay the odd speeding ticket or just don't drive, right? But yeah, everything, everybody is a corporation and everything, all buildings or whatever, corporations. Yeah. Well, and it, it all comes under contract law, right? In the okay. common law. Yeah, your common law right to contract. So contract with government at will. Take advantage of programs if you want to. Like, I'm not even saying they're your enemy. They are when they try to force things on you. Then that man becomes my enemy. Like somebody takes Exactly. Something like that, right? Yeah, we won't even get into that one. I, I'm not a big fan of the whole baby theft kind of thing. I get really personally offended by that. Sorry. Uh, but, uh, no, I, I like to talk about it. We don't have time today. It's kind of my meaning on that. Um, so that's, that's the whole point of this all. It's all about your, your demeanor and how you're conducting yourself. And people have to realize that if you want to be a, like, what, what some people call a free man and you want to assume full liability for your actions, be prepared to pay the consequences of your actions. Right? You're free to do whatever you want, but you cannot escape the consequences of your actions. That's a maximum of law. And tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye. So you're, you're more than welcome to go out in the world and do whatever you want in your own private capacity as a free man. But be prepared to answer for it if you harm somebody. Right? So government is not my enemy until they try to force things on me. And that means if I get pulled over and I've got a private plate, I've properly rescinded my contracts with the government. Yeah, they're just trying to pull me over and, and charge me with a traffic offense, and they're, they're the ones, you know, you produce a license, or I'm arresting you right now on the spot. And okay? Else yeah, that yeah, that man's not my friend anymore. He's not he's not a public servant. He's now he's now my enemy. Right. He's attacking me. Well, this here's something that I think about free men is that they're always peaceful and respectful at all times. You know, you've got to try until it's time to not be respectful. Well, you can run for as far as you can, and then it becomes legally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But the best course of action is when you run into that problem, and I say this all the time, is if you have a fee schedule in place, just sit there and enjoy the abuse and smile and say, dude, you just paid for a lifetime of margaritas on a beach by what you did. Ten right? million bucks for every broken rib. Yep. And give, them, and give them notice. I did the thing, too, where I refused to give the guy my name one time. I was just being obstinate, period. Even though I had a fee schedule in place, I just said, no. I said, no. I said, you're not producing a claim. Period. I wasn't even speeding. There was actually no reason for the guy to pull me over at all. I said, I'm not even giving you a name. And that lasted for four days I was in jail. I did not care, right? I'm still enforcing the fee schedule anyways, but I, you know, I'm more than happy to give him a name now. As long as the fee schedule in place, say, yeah, yeah, my name's Dean Clifford. I'm the director of, of this legal person at this contact address. And if you check on the computer, I'm pretty sure there's a fee schedule in place right now that has a... a it has an article in place for the damage you're causing me right now. Just so you're aware, it's cost me this much money. I just told you guys even before we were on camera tonight the story about, uh, again, uh, my, my brother seems to get in as much trouble as I do, even though... Well, you always got to get that in before yeah. it's always best. Yeah, and he, uh, a lot of these confrontations now, if people are saying the right words, are ending with ones like he just had there on Thursday last week where uh, the cop ordered him, ordered him out of the truck because he wouldn't produce a driver's license. And he said, well, he said, sure, that's not a problem. But it's going to cost you 50 grand because I don't do anything for free without a court order. If you get a court order, I'll do it. Otherwise, it's going to cost you 50 grand because I'm charging for it and I don't work for free. The cop's like, oh, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So he gets out and he stands right where he said he was going to get out and stand. The cop's like, well, no, I need you in the back of my car while I take a statement or whatever while I write up the paperwork. And he said, no, no, my, our agreement was I was going to stand right here for 50 grand. Thank you. You now owe me 50,000 bucks, by the way. And there's two of you, so that's 100,000 bucks. Say, if you want me in the back of your car, it's going to cost you a million. I said, I'm not going to go willingly. That's going to be against my consent. I'm not going with you. And if you force me, that's going to cost you a million bucks. And the cop just went, ah, I don't care, just stay there then. You know? 
But as defenders of the public peace, they can't also uh, bring arguments against you. Don't get into that kind of argument with them at the side of the road. I'm a defender of the public police and all that kind of, you're going to go to the loony bin if he starts with that kind of stuff, right? I hate to say it, it's, it's probably all valid. It mostly is. If you look at the Criminal Code of Canada... We also have C-3PO uh, trying to start or whatever. Yep. So this year be another yep. Oh, yeah, another topic for that one. Uh, the Criminal Code of Canada, I can look it up. Uh, the piece of definition of a peace officer in the Criminal Code of Canada, not under another act. The highest station that a cop can hold is a peace officer which is something everybody is. It actually says right in the criminal code, we're all peace officers. That is in there, and I think some couple of you even know that. So they have to come out from every, under every single statute they're under, they have to come out from behind it to achieve the same thing that we're capable of being, which is a peace officer. That's their highest authority. So when they're enforcing a statute against you, they're actually of a lower capacity than they would be if they were just enforcing, uh, if there was a, like a complaint or a breach of the peace made against you. Right? But I always call them public servants. So anyways, that's some of the philosophy about going in there is, you know, yeah, you should be conducting yourself in an honorable manner until your adversary is being dishonorable. But even then, don't fight them. Believe me, they're just going to make you regret that you, you fought back. Or at least one raised that blood all Yep. And they have roles as well. Yep. And as long as you've got your fee schedule in place and you have identified yourself, and I'm big on that, but don't, I, don't identify themselves in the way you, they want you to identify yourself. They want you to be a public servant. And you can tell them flat out, and my brother did that uh, when they gave him his ticket uh, there on Thursday. They gave him a ticket for uh, driving without a license because he refused to produce it because there was no claim being made against him, right? So they said, uh, they, they, or no, they, they made him sign a, uh, a warrant, I think, for, uh, to, to appear for the assault charge or something. And so uh, he signed it, Director 4, then a signature, and then all rights reserved right below it. You know, and the two of them, the two, the two of them grabbed that and they ran back to their car and they're, they're both looking at that and they're looking at him. Yeah, and they were not happy about that. Eh? It took them a good couple of minutes before they came back and, they're, and then they started demanding ID from them again. Because, then, because they, they realized they're hooped, eh? Very fundamental things that they need in order to obtain a conviction. Yeah, yeah. You've got to remove jurisdiction from them to enforce the Highway Traffic Act on you, to tow your vehicle, and the best way to do that is to not have a license at all. It's a big fear thing. People think, oh my God, if I'm driving around with no, no license plate, they're going to tow my car and I'm never going to get it back. I got news for you, okay, from somebody with experience in this matter. If you have a license plate, they are definitely going to tow your vehicle because that gives them the jurisdiction to do it. If there is no plate, they have no jurisdiction to tow your vehicle. None. And we've proven that now. All you have to do is go and get it. Exactly, but, but there's no charge. Do it in advance. That's your that exactly. That's your fee schedule you're sending into the government. So that's we're gonna get into that for people to do that so they can start driving with their own license plate. Uh, yeah. and if you were there you could say I'm in peaceable possession of it, how can you declare it abandoned? Yeah, that, that would never happen. The one time that it has happened now that one of us did get pulled over their own private plate, we all know the story on that one, they just towed it back to the guy's house. He just put a pl his spare plate on it, was driving it five minutes later. Right? Big deal. But he now had a claim against the city, and we filed the lawsuit in Queen's Bench the next day. And we told him we were going to do that. We want them to know that we mean it from now on when we say things. We're, we're men of our word. Yes. If we tell you you're going to be in Queen's Bench on Monday, we go down, we file Monday. Okay? So the second time, about three weeks after that, uh, they were parked out here in front of the office the one day with, uh, where the Jeep there is there with the sovereign plate you guys have seen on there. Yeah. Um, they sat out here for 45 minutes talking and uh, they ran the plate, called it into head office, uh, and then they drove away. <coughs> they, knew, they knew the second time, don't tow that. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, I don't know. <coughs> But they drove away. Technically speaking, that vehicle had no plate on it. So they should have towed it, according system. to their system. Right. But because we'd already given them notice now, there's about four or five of us now that drive with plates like that. And that's actually something else that you can cover at a later date. Yep. common law jurisdiction like that, where you, where somebody claiming common law jurisdiction can draw authority from. Like if there's a private passenger vehicle clause in Alberta, I wouldn't use any statutes. You don't need it. Don't use any statutes to defend yourself in any way. That's their. Yeah. Something to like 
for passage, which turns into commercial transaction. Well, it's, hip it's, it's hypocritical.